Sunday mornings we've been going through the book of Genesis and we found ourselves at the story of Joseph. What a wonderful story the story of Joseph is. It is it's a story here that talks about relationships. Relationships between each other and, and uh, there are some problems in this relationship and how these relationships can be helped. It is also a wonderful picture of salvation. In the story of Joseph, we have salvation being demonstrated and pictured for us. As we get to the New Testament, we have this explained, what was going on and how salvation works. We have the importance of confessing, saying what really needs to be said and confessing what is going on. And we confess to the Lord our need of a Savior. Romans 10 says that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, God, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The importance of that. We also looked at the importance of chastening. We looked at this last week. Chastening is when God reminds you you, have some, you need something that you need to get right. It's not, it's not a punishment. It's just God reminding you. And he does that to all. If you're his child and you're a believer, God is doing that in you. If you do something that's not... According to the way he wants it, he will remind you, you need to make this right. You need to go to someone and confess this, even to the Lord or to someone. Today is another important ingredient in what we know as salvation. There's a long reading that I'm going to read today. and I, This is, if you are you know, in ministry and you learn how to, you know, they're, they're teaching you in, in school about preaching and preaching the scriptures... I'm going to do something that they say is a no-no, all right? And that is read a long portion of Scripture. You don't ever read a long portion of Scripture. You lose people and all kinds of things like that. So let me, let me say, when I get finished, will you all just look at me like, so I know that I haven't lost anybody. If you're asleep by the time I'm reading, I'm going to say, that's why they say not to read long. Look at that. Everybody's asleep on me. So I'm just teaching. But the length of this passage points out the importance of this ingredient that we're going to talk about. The length of the passage is dealing with this issue and the very fact that it's a long time, and there's two chapters dealt with this, places an importance on this. So I don't want to minimize this, but I, I want you to stay with me if you will. Remember, before we get to chapter 43, Joseph's brothers have sinned against him. They have sold him into slavery. They were upset with him. They did not like the fact that he, he was showed some, what they saw as favoritism. He had these dreams, and in his dreams, he, it looked like the family was bound down to him, and, and they, they didn't like that at all. And so they sin against Joseph, but it's interesting that, as we look into scriptures, the emphasis of this is the sin of these brothers against their father, and that's what we'll see today in this. They sinned against their father by sinning against Joseph. And so this is the emphasis that we find in this story itself. We see it even in these verses. I'm going to read these pretty much without comment. I will mention a key verse in our reading today, though. When I get to it, it is a key verse that's going to point out something. Because I want, to, I want you to notice, as we're reading this, I want you to see if you see a change in these brothers. Remember, the brothers are very jealous. They're very sensitive to... The situation at home did not like what had happened uh, with their brother and did not mind doing wrong to their brother and, and it hurt their father. See if there is a change in the reading today. And the key is in when Joseph begins his words, when Joseph starts. Now, that change is what we're going to talk about today. The change in attitude is very key in this thing that we call salvation as well as in our Christian living. And so that is what we're going to emphasize. So see if you see that. We'll begin reading in chapter 43 of Genesis and we'll read for a little while, okay? When we get to Exodus about th chapter 30, then you know we're about, about done. <laughs> Genesis chapter 43. The famine was sore in the land and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah said unto him, saying, spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. 
And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether ye had a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state, and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we had told him, we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me. We will arise and go. We may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not down to thee and, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a ma the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices and bird, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your brother and Benjamin if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took that present, they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. <coughs> and when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, remember this is through an interpreter, bring these men home and slay and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house, and the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, Because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time are we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our asses. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass, and we came to the inn, and we opened our sacks, and behold... Every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your fathers have given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their asses provender and they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon and they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste for his vows did yearn unto his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself from said, set on bread. And they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. They sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright and, and the youngest according to his youth and the men marveled one at another. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him but Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city, and not yet far away, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when, ye, when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Have ye done evil? 
Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore sayest my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servant should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? <clears throat> With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now... Also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laden every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there. And they fell before him on the ground. Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Wot ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say? Here's the key verse. What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, Joseph said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even his favor. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he leave his father, his father would die. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother... Come down with you, ye shall set, see my face no more. And it came to fast, pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, and we, said we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be not with us, uh, be with us, then will we go down, for we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, thy father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. The one went out from me, and, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to my, thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad and to my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reading and thank you for what you're doing in these verses and thank you for the story that we have before us. Thank you for the change that we see going on in these brothers' heart. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us as we look at this. We will understand the importance of this in our lives today. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. The word that I want to talk to you about today that was demonstrated in these verses of Scripture is the New Testament word repentance. Repentance. Repentance is that subtle change in a person's heart and mind when they turn from blaming someone else to taking full responsibility for one's actions. And we call that repentance. 
There is a change of heart. Instead of blaming God and blaming someone else, a person says, I am a sinner before God. I need a Savior. Instead of blaming other people for actions that we would take, make and blaming people for things that we have done, instead of doing that, we take responsibility for our actions. That change that takes place, that subtle shift, it cannot be, you can see the fruits of it, but it takes place in one's heart. That change is what is called repentance. This is what we see happening with these brothers. I hope you saw that from our story. They were very quick to abuse Joseph and didn't care about him, sold him. They're ready to kill him, in fact. Knowing the heart of their father toward him, they didn't care about that. They were hurt and they were offended because of the specialness that Joseph was shown. We see a change that takes place. We see a shift that went on in these verses of Scripture. And these brothers' hearts changed. Now repentance is something that is talked about a lot in the New Testament. John the Baptist, when he came, we have him coming. He's preaching a message, getting ready for the Lord to come. And what is his message? Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ is there. And his message to them was repent. Our Lord himself and throughout the scriptures uses the word repent as he is preaching early on in his ministry and later. He says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There is a need. There is a, a, a need for this repentance. Peter himself on the day of Pentecost, the first message that's being preached as the Holy Spirit descends and God is doing this wonderful work and, and what we know as, as Pentecost, the, the church and what God is establishing in, in this thing called the church and, and uh, we're enjoying the benefits and blessings of this now. The first message being preached to them when the Spirit descended, Peter preaches and his words that come out of his mouth and they ask, what should we do? We're seeing God work. What should we do? And he says, repent. Repent. There's an attitude change. It's like the two-headed coin that has faith in one side and repentance on the other. The two go together. Paul, in preaching to the churches throughout the book of Acts, he preached repentance. And we see this throughout the New Testament. Repentance, repentance. There's an attitude change. It's interesting that today we're living in a culture, and I think you're aware of this. I, I, I will say this as a, without proof, but I think that we would be aware of this, that we're living in a culture today where people are shy to take responsibility for things. They're ready to find someone to blame for whatever's going on, whatever's happening in their life. Dave Hunt, in his Seduction of Christianity, written in the 80s, and then for years after that, was he's with the Lord now, but for years he would point out the, the problems of modern-day psychology because the emphasis of our, some of our modern-day psychology was find someone that you can blame for what you're doing. Blame your parents. That's, that's a good, uh, op, you know, good place to start. Blame your parents for why you are like you are. After all, that you were in their home for so long, and... And so you want to, you know, you got a, a good place to start there. And I mean, we saw this with the, the, the trials that came on through the 90s and uh, brothers that killed their parents and they killed their parents and the jury did not find them guilty because of their parents that had failed to help them with this problem that they had. And so they were able to find, that, blame their parents for it. All kinds of things happened. And it, doesn't uh, stop there. This is something very natural for us. It's not something that we have to work at and learn. It's very natural for me to, to blame somebody else for why I do what I do. You know? And even in our confession of sin, sometimes we confess and say, you know, Lord, I would not have done that had it not been for this wife that you gave me. Does that not sound like Genesis chapter 3? Where Adam was asked by God and asked you, why did you do this? Well, the wife that you gave me, Lord, that's why I did it. No, you know, he... Uh, we, we, we do that today. You know, well, I wouldn't have done this if it hadn't have been for that person. If, when they provoked me, that's why I ran them off the road. Or that's why I punched them. And 
We want to blame somebody else for our actions. It's very natural for us. It's unnatural. Repentance is something that is unnatural. But it is very important. Very necessary. It is demonstrated in this story. And I want to mention just a few things about repentance this morning and then we're done. First of all, <laughs> repentance is a change of heart. Repentance is a change of heart. That's what it means. It produces actions. It produces fruit. You'll see the evidence of it. But it's not the fruit that is the thing that's emphasized. Repentance, as emphasized in the scripture, is the change that takes place in a person's heart. Where you have been blaming other people. You have been finding someone else to put this on and hang this on. And now there's a change in your heart where you say, I did it. I did it. Judah is the example where he says, God hath brought forth. God is the one who has found out the iniquity of of your servants. He's talking to Joseph through an interpreter. God has found out our sin. It's not our father's. It's not our father's treatment that he gave Joseph a coat of many colors that did this. We did it. We made the choice. We did this and God has found this out. Very key there. The brothers before cared only about themselves. They were very sensitive to jealousy and uh, they were ticked off by the special treatment that their father showed them. It's interesting, we've had four kids and every one of them believed that we have shown favor to all the others. You know, you have more, maybe you'll see that. You know, none of them ever stand up and say, you know what, I'm the special one. I'm the favorite. You know, maybe yours might say that, but I would say, well, I mean, they're the favorite. You, did, you let them do that and you didn't let me. No, we didn't. You know, you know. We often tell them, well, we love them more than we love you. <laughs> you know, that's what they're thinking, so you might as well tell them. You know, they're thinking that. But, uh, but they, at this point, they're not saying to Joseph, you know, but you don't realize, well, we, we did this because of what our father did. We did this because of the situation we were in. That's why we did it. No, they're saying, <coughs> Judah speaking for them, God has found out our sin. We are the ones that did it. There was a change. Now Joseph put them through a test to see if they really had changed. You know what he did? He showed specialness to Benjamin. He gives them gifts. They're at the table eating and they're already nervous because this man was rough with them. And now they're brought into his house to eat with him. And they're a little bit concerned about this. And then they get welcoming gifts coming to Egypt. <laughs> they bring him out gifts and they bring them all. And when we come to Benjamin... Five times as much as the others got, Benjamin gets clothes and, and some money for the trip and all this stuff. Five times what the others got. If their hearts were the same, they would have said, why is Benjamin, what he deserve to get all that for? What's he doing? And then unbeknownst to them, Joseph plants this cup in Benjamin's sack. And when they get to the end, and they're overtaken by the the security detail, and accused of things that we never would have done this. They didn't do it. Joseph planted this on them to see their response. Planted in Benjamin's sack. If they had that same attitude to Benjamin that they had to Joseph, they would have been glad to take send Benjamin away. They said, Benjamin, what's wrong with you? What were you doing? What were you thinking to take this man's cup? Benjamin said, like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, it's there. Look at you. All right? I'm sorry. You have to go. We're going home. We have nothing to do with this. We're, we're, our hands are clean. That have been very, very quickly to let Benjamin face the consequences of his own actions. Their heart was changed, however. You see it in Judah. Judah says, this is going to kill my dad. This will kill our father. We, we can't. They didn't know whether Benjamin had done this or not. Benjamin's saying I, he didn't do it. There's the evidence. What are you doing? What are you talking about? There's the evidence. I didn't do it. it. Puts the whole group in trouble. And Judah stands up and says, Yeah, but this will kill our father. Before, they didn't care about their father. Their heart has changed. They had an opportunity to leave Benjamin behind. But Judah is concerned for his father. A total flip. This change that we're talking about, a change in their heart, 
is what we call repentance. Joseph saw this. He saw this. They do not know he understands them. He's speaking through an interpreter. He understands every word they're saying. Let me say something. This, is, this attitude change is absolutely necessary for salvation. We have, to be, we have to have that attitude to receive the Lord as our Savior. We come to the Lord. It's not just a matter of somebody saying, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say, oh, really? That sounds like a good thing to do. What do I have to do? We just pray this little prayer. Pray a little prayer. That's all you do. Yeah, just pray a little prayer. Now lay me down to sleep. Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, pray a little prayer. I'm, I'm good. You're good? Yeah, I'm good. No, there has to be a heart change where a person sees a need for Jesus Christ and they receive Him as their Savior. See, the Bible tells us we're born in sin. Romans chapter 5 says that there's, there's born in us an enmity against God. It's the word enmity, which, which means there's, a, there's an antagonism in every person against God. You say, well, I don't have that. I've never had that. The Bible says you have. The Bible says this is the natural state of the human heart to have this antagonism against God. And that's what our... When I say that today, I get in trouble with organized religion because organized religion says every man has this wonderful love for God in his heart. And all you have to do is fan that a little bit, encourage him a little bit, just give him the right opportunity. And the Bible tells us, I'm not the authority, but the Bible tells us we are all in this state of enmity against God. The natural state of our heart is against God. And there has to be a change where a person's heart now turns. And instead of blaming God for things and being upset with God, how could God do that? And how could He not do this? And why did He not do good to me? And look what all I've tried to do for God. And why would He ever do this to me? And having this kind of attitude to turning and saying, God... I deserve nothing from you. I am guilty. I am guilty as charged. I am a sinner before you. That's called repentance. Change of a person's heart. And at that state, you receive what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross in payment of your sins. That's called salvation. It's not praying a little prayer, not adding a little something to your life, not going to church, giving money, saying all the things, doing all these things. It's a change of heart. You lay down your arms. You surrender your will and say, God, you are right. I am a sinner and I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. It's absolutely necessary for salvation. Let me ask you a question. Have you done this? Have you personally done this? Nobody can make you do this. It's a voluntary thing where you, on your own accord, say, God, you are God. You have made this salvation. You have provided for sinful men, and we are all in that state, every one of us. And you have provided this for us. I surrender my fighting against you. I accept you as my personal Savior. If you have done that, God saved you when you've done that. And then all your life after that is living for the Lord. If you have not done that, God wants to save you today. But it's also not only for salvation, but it's necessary for growing as a believer. Once you get saved, you enter like the door of this building. You come in and now you can look around and go around in different places. and You can see the different rooms in here. And that's the way salvation is pictured. Once you trust the Lord as your Savior, you enter into a new life and a walk with Christ. And you are a believer now. You're God's child. There's all kinds of things you learn as a believer. You're growing in that walk with God. And to grow in your walk with God, you have to have that same attitude. That attitude of, if God says something, you're not fighting God. You accept what He says. You don't blame God. But God, I go to church all the time. I'm there when the doors are open. Why do I have this flat tire? You'd think that as God, as big as you are, you could keep me from having a flat tire. When I do all this for you. Have you ever seen that attitude? Ever seen it out there? Ever had it yourself? It is the opposite of this attitude of repentance. As a believer, we have this attitude of contrition before God. And God works in us and uses us and, and conforms us into His image as we have this attitude. 
You know how a good example of this depicted is in Matthew chapter 15 where the Lord comes to this woman and she's not a Jew. She comes and she says, Oh, Lord, my, my daughter is sick. She is very sick. And you can heal her if you would. Jesus looks at her and says, Why would I do that? I'm, I'm doing this for the Jewish people and you're not a Jew. And we consider you dogs. He says this to her. Well, who are you to call me a dog? And she nails it. No, she doesn't. You know what she says? Here's what she says. Lord, even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus says to everybody, do you see what that woman said? That is great faith. Be it unto you. What do you want? It's done. And he says to everybody, that is faith. Why is that? She did not have this attitude. Well, who are you, God? Or who are you, the Lord, to call me this? She had this attitude of repentance. And God gave to her what she requested. That is important in us if we are going to grow in our walk with the Lord. It is a change of heart. Second thing that we note is you have to take the initiative. Some people say, well, I'm waiting around. I'll wait until it just comes all over me. I'll wait until all of a sudden I feel warm and fuzzy. Like, whoo, whoo, that was good. Man, I felt repentance. Whoo. It, it, it doesn't happen like that. It's not a passive thing. It's in the New Testament, it's always in the imperative. Repent, repent. You do this. You have this attitude. You put this attitude into practice. For salvation... You surrender your will to God. And say, I, I'm, I'm not fighting God anymore. I accept what He has done. But you have the key to the door that opens this. You have the key. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 is an important verse. The Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm outside knocking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. If you'll open the door, I will come in. But you have to open the door. You are the one that has to do the initiating. He's ready. He's willing to do whatever you need in your life. You have to open the door. How do you open the door? It's that attitude of your heart. It's changed. It opens your, the door. It lets the Lord in. For salvation, but also for surrender in growing. It's that attitude that you initiate. I will do what God says. I am not blaming anybody else anymore. I'm not blaming my callousness on my husband anymore. I'm not blaming it on the church. That rotten pastor we have. I'm not blaming it on this or that. I'm taking full responsibility for where I should be and I surrender that. Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. <coughs> there are going to be bad things happen. Different things happen. Absolutely. But God wants us to be humble before Him and not blaming other people. Luke 17, 3. If your brother sin against you, rebuke him. If he repents, the attitude changes then forgive him. If he does this seven times in a day, forgive him. So it's not passive. You take the initiative with this attitude and, and have it. Okay, I'm going to have this attitude toward God. That's the right attitude. I'm having it. So God can work. The third thing is, and we're done. It takes the Word of God working in our life with oftentimes pressure from circumstances to bring us to this point. The Word of God pounding on us Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Old Testament talks about God taking like a, a sledgehammer and pounding on us and breaking us. What is He doing? He's talking about that will, that determined stubbornness of us. He's breaking that so that we can, we'll surrender to Him. Not surrender to a church, surrender to a pastor. We're talking about surrendering to Him through His Word. And it takes the Word of God that God uses to pound on us with circumstances that happen in our lives. This is what we see in this chapters that we read that happened to Joseph's brothers. The circumstances that they were in. God takes these things and reminds us of where we need to be. And this story points this out to us. We call that often conviction, repentance and conviction, these different things that work hand in hand with us. God putting pressure on us through conviction to bring us to that point of repentance for salvation or for a surrendered walk with the Lord where we want to do what He asks us to do. We're no longer defending ourselves. We, 
want to know, Lord, what do you want us to do with this life? We don't have the attitude that I had to my dad. We talked about it in my Sunday school this morning. Where I went to my dad. Maybe you did that as well to your parents growing up. Say, Dad, can, can I do this? Everybody's doing it. Do you ever say that to your folks? My dad would say, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you jump with them? You ever, anybody ever had to say that? Your parents say that to you? I mean, Daddy, but they're not jumping off a cliff. <laughs> He'd explain why. Here's why I don't think you should do this. And then my attitude was either right with my father or or wrong. And oftentimes it took a while. It took to where I had kids of my own, and I realized now I see why my dad did what he did, and he's not even here to me to tell him. I'm sorry for fighting him. The goal, God's goal is changing our hearts. That's the issue. Amen. The heart is the issue. This is necessary for salvation. It is necessary for us to surrender in our lives so that we're walking the way God wants us to walk in this life. Joy abounding in our lives as we're doing what God asks. It's not a legalistic, you've got to do these things and you've got to do that. No, it's joyfully doing what God asks us to do with the right heart attitude. God does this in us. We know that God is right. He is good. What He asks of us is great. We're not fighting Him. Some people have the attitude that God is in heaven and He just wants to rain on our parade. I mean, we want to have, we just want to enjoy life and he wants to do everything to keep us from enjoying life. Absolutely not true. God could not love you any more than he loves you. He loves you more than anybody else loves you. And what he asks of us is good. And when we're convinced of that and our heart changes to that position as a believer, that's called repentance. There's a change that takes place. When that turn happens and you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's called salvation. Have you done that? What area is God working on in you? I don't know. It could be an area of salvation. Or you realize I've never come to that point where I've surrendered my will to God. There's, just, there's still that little fight that shows up every now and then. I just get at, upset at God. Why would God do this? And why would He do that? I've never come to that point. Today's the day of salvation. If you'll turn in your heart and accept Jesus Christ, He will save you. What's the area of obedience in your life that God's calling you to? And you have all kinds of excuses. Why am I not going to do that? Well, look, it's not happening today. Nobody else is doing this. Why should I do that? But here it is in the Word of God. Ooh. Well, we tear that out like happens today. We'll just tear it right out of the Bible. What area of obedience is God working in you? It's important that our heart attitude turns to God and say, God, I want to do what you ask me to do if nobody's doing it. If you said for me to do it, I want to do what you ask me to do. That's the heart God wants from you. You know what happens? God pours himself into your life when that happens. That's what he wants. He wants that blessing. It's in your hands. These brothers give us a good example of that. God wants that from us today. Where is that with you? Let's stand together this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you've given to us. Thank you for this example that we have in these brothers. The heart change that took place in them and the heart change that is necessary for salvation. Not only for salvation, but for sanctification, for living and growing as a believer where our heart is surrendered to you. Dear God, I pray you'd work in hearts today. Help people to know that you love them. You have provided salvation for them through Jesus Christ that their eternity might be changed forever. May they throw up the white flag, surrender their will, and accept what you have done for them in Jesus Christ. If there's someone here who's never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, would, they, would you convince them of your love and that we love them and we want them to come and accept you as their Savior. And they're will, they're, may they be willing to do that today. Maybe there's an area of an obedience in our lives, Lord, and you know those areas. I don't, but you do. That need surrender to you. May we surrender our will, surrender our defensiveness against you and defending our actions, defending our sin, surrendering to you, having this attitude of contrition and repentance and allow you to work in us. Would you create that in us today? We have to take the initiative. You're knocking. 
You're knocking through this sermon today, through your word. I pray that we'll open the door to you. We ask for Jesus' sake.